In this video, I'm going to talk about two subjects that aren't really related. However, both of these subjects will not require very much time to discuss for our needs, so I've decided to squoosh the two of them into a single video. Today we're going to discuss binary coded decimal and the ASCII table. So let's start with binary coded decimal. Now, um, let's say we have a number like 47. This is not a big number, but let's say we have a, a nice decimal number like 47 that we're going to represent inside of the computer. If we were on an older system that gave us uh, feedback using series of bulbs so that we could see the binary pattern for 47, uh, it would be a little bit difficult for us to interpret instinctively. So let's work that out. So if we want to figure out the binary for 47, I'm going to use the way where I just write down the powers of 2 that I'm aware of. So I know 32 is 1, uh, 16 is 1, 8 is 1, 4 is 1, 2 is 1, and so is 1. So I have a bunch of bits worth these values, and I need to put zeros or ones in there. Notice I didn't go further here to 64 because uh, I would never include the 64 bit to reach the number 47 because it would be too big. But this will be 32 for sure. And once I've put a 1 in 32, that leaves me with 15 more. So 16 is unnecessary. And uh, to reach 15, that's actually 8 plus 4, which is 12, plus 2, which is 14, plus 1, which is 15. So each of these bits are a 1. So here's the binary for 47. But I have to imagine that I'm being confronted with a panel of LEDs. Uh, there are some bulbs in front, uh, or LEDs, bulbs, in front that are turned off, meaning there's a zero there, and it, these few bulbs at the end that are turned on, meaning there are ones. Now even though there's only five lights lit, uh, this is not so easy to read as the number 47, because I have to do a bunch of the arithmetic in my head, uh, you know, adding the, the 32. Now this part down here is not so bad. 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1, uh, that's 15. And in fact, if I use the bottom four bits, there's not really that many different things that I can have, only 16 different numbers from 0 to 15. Uh, so we can, we can deal with looking at binary in very small quantities of bits, but even uh, one or two bits larger than that, and it's not so easy to see the result. Uh, now, we may also want to do mathematics inside of an old computer, and we don't have the same type of circuit, so we, we might want to do our mathematics in decimal. Both of these circumstances, doing decimal-oriented mathematics and doing um, setting up an output panel of bulbs or something similar, to some similar effect, uh, give us a reason for a totally alternate uh, base number system. But it's not your traditional positional number system, so we didn't cover it before. This is something called binary coded decimal, which we usually shorthand B, C, D. And binary coded decimal recognizes the fact that humans can very quickly understand uh, single digits when represented in binary, single decimal digits, because the only decimal digits we have, right, so decimal coefficients are really in that range from 0 all the way to 9, right? No big deal at all. Uh, very few values. So the largest of these numbers is 9. And if we think about how many bits it takes to have the number 9, we'd need a bit for 8 and a bit for 1. So it takes the 4 bits down here. We'd need these other two to put zeros in. But with 4 bits, we could show all the numbers from 0 to 9, where 0 would be all zeros, and 9 would be 1, 0, 0, 1. Now let's write that out. We'll just pick some numbers from here that we were working with. So let's say we have a 4. And let's say we have a 7, and we want to show those individual values as um, binary patterns. So we know we only need 4 bits, the 8-bit, the 4-bit, the 2-bit, and the 1-bit. For each of these then, 8 is the, or I'm sorry, 4 is going to be a 1 in the 4-bit and a 0 everywhere else. And a 7 is going to be 1, 1, 1. So we can look at these two 4-bit patterns in isolation and very quickly discern that this is 4 and that this is 7. And from this, we uh, coalesce our new 
type of representation, binary coded decimal, in which we do something like this. If I want the number 47 decimal to be put into a binary computer but recorded in binary coded decimal, then what I'm going to do is take each of these decimal digits and store it in four bits of information. So in binary coded decimal, since this is two digits, I'll need four bits for the four. These will have to represent four. Then I'll need four bits after that for the seven. Then I just put them there. So four is zero, one, zero, zero. And seven is zero, one, one, one. And so if we just isolate that bit string all together, then we have uh, one bit string that has eight bits. And if we put the subscript BCD, then we know that this binary string is really encoded in binary coded decimal. And we can determine that it's a 47. So let's do this with another number, like uh, a decimal value 8,329. And so if I had this decimal value and I want to record it in binary coded decimal, it will become a bit string, so a string of ones and zeros. But there'll be four bits for each of these numbers. So now I just write the four bit pattern for eight, which is one, zero, zero, zero. That's the eight bit and none of the others. Then the four bit pattern for three, zero, zero, one, one. The four bit pattern for two, zero, zero, one, zero. And the four bit pattern for nine, one, zero, zero, one, B, C, D. Now, squooshed all together, uh, it's a uh, confusing set of bits just like any other. But if you were going to provide this in output, you would just provide some mechanism to distinguish each four-bit group, like putting a space between each set of bulbs or something like that. But we'll just underline them here so that we can see the, the groupings of four bits. And then it's actually pretty easy to see that this is a 9, this is a 2, this is a 3, and this is an 8. Now to go the other direction, I'm just going to write down some pattern of bits and then we'll see what the uh, decimal equivalent of that is. And you'll see that the conversion from binary coded to de decimal to decimal is really very fast. So let's do like this one 16 bits. Uh, let's see here. Uh, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay, so there is a 16-bit binary coded decimal value. And we want to know the decimal equivalent. So the main thing is we just need to visualize each of the groupings of four bits. There they are. So it should be pretty easy. This is the binary for 4 plus 1 is 5. This is the binary for 8 plus 1, that's 9. Here's the binary for 4 plus 2, 6. And here's the binary for 1, 1. And so we are able to do the conversion. Now the second topic that I want to talk about is uh, the ASCII character code system. Now, uh, whenever we store information uh, on a computer that isn't about numbers, uh, you know, it might be something else. It could be what color is a, a particular uh, garment, you know, for a database. Typically, we'll represent that set of colors as uh, one from a finite set of numbers. So we wouldn't really store the word red or blue or so on, we'd probably say that red is equivalent to the number one, and we store one because it saves some space. Now, uh, and, and also it, it, it appeals to the natural binary uh, numeric data uh, system inside of our computers. So when we want to uh, characterize strings, particularly strings just made of individual characters, the individual character data is often represented in uh, what we call an ASCII format. Now that doesn't mean that uh, the, the letter A shows up as an extra fancy A or anything like that. It just means that things like capital A, lowercase b, uh, left parentheses, semicolon, and space characters, and other such things 
uh, that we think about abstractly and that we would see visually output in a particular way are actually represented inside of the computers as just some number. So the ASCII table is a standardization, uh, long-standing, that's used for this. So here is the ASCII table uh, and uh, from uh, copied from Wikipedia. Uh, and in it, we can see a number of different things. So first of all, what we have in the kind of teal columns uh, indicate the actual characters being represented. And if you're all the way on the left-hand side of this table, all of these characters are known as unprintable characters. So things like the backspace and the horizontal tab, uh, negative acknowledgement, most of these are functional characters are, and, and aren't really characters that we type in strings. At least the, the vast majority of them are not. And they're considered unprintable. Once we get here to the 32nd, uh, or it really is the 33rd character in the table, but it's number 32, or index 32, we start the printable set of characters. And the first of those is the space character. Now this is just a bunch of symbol characters here we can see. The space character, exclamation point, double quotes, pound, dollar sign, percent symbol, etc. But all the characters that are on our keyboards need to be somewhere in here. So here they are. Here are a bunch of the characters. And then here starts the numeric characters. So here we see the character 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 9. Now I say they're characters because these are not actually the numbers 0 through 9. These are like the letters on a typewriter, or the letters on your keyboard, uh, which are distinctly different from the numbers 0 through 9. And they're different because of the ASCII table. It certainly is possible for someone to make a standardized set of codes so that the numeric digits 0 through 9 are actually the 0th through 9th entries in that code's lookup table. But that's just not the way we have it today. We have this ASCII table. But it is not important uh, what numbers these characters actually are. So it, it doesn't matter so much that uh, if you have the decimal number 48 stored somewhere, that that's really equivalent to the uh, character of the digit 0. That doesn't matter so much at all. Not nearly so much as the fact that the character 0 is just before the character 1 in the table, and 1 is just before the character 2. Similarly, if we look at the letter characters, here are the capital letters up here. A comes right before B, which comes right before C, which comes right before D, etc. Lowercase a comes right before B, comes right before C, etc. We don't see such order in the symbols. But that's really of no consequence to us because the symbols don't have a fundamental order in our minds. But letters of the alphabet, when they're uppercase or lowercase, do. Digits uh, in our numbering systems do have an order. And so regardless of the standardized uh, coding system that you're using for characters, you're probably going to be using ASCII uh, for a great number of things, but there are other ones historically. One's called Epsidic, and, and then there are still more. But in all of those circumstances, whichever one you're using, somebody is going to be uh, have deftly organized these so that the numerals are all in order, the lowercase letters are in order, and the uppercase letters are in order. And that gives us some unique capabilities. So while we may be able to look up an ASCII table like you see here, whenever we want. Or if you're on a Linuxy, Unixy machine, you can always, from the console, type uh, man ASCII to get the manual page for the ASCII table. Uh, we don't often actually need to know these numbers at all. We just need to know about those relationships. And I'll show you how that works, uh, again, from the overhead. So what we can do when we have uh, that basic understanding of the ASCII table, uh, and more importantly, that regardless of whether we're using ASCII or EBCDIC or something else, the numbers, letters, and so on are all going to be put in order, we can use this for conversion capabilities. So let's say we acquired a um, string of characters, or, or let's just for right now say we got a character. 
So we got a character, uh, we'll call it C, and it gets set by some kind of fancy input function. So we don't really care about the, what this function does, but we know it returns a particular character as entered by somebody controlling an input device. Maybe it's the keyboard, maybe it's something else. Um, and we'll just leave this code simple like this. So we have a character uh, like this. Now I want to know if that character is a letter. Now in the C type languages and most every other language, there are pre-existing standard functions to determine such things. If this is a lowercase letter that somebody typed, uh, if it's a uppercase letter that somebody typed, is it a digit that somebody typed, and so on. Um, but we don't necessarily need those because of the fact that these values are encoded in order. So if I wanted to know that these things were lowercase, I wanted to print it out that this character was lowercase, I could do something very simple. So I'll, I'll write a quick if statement here that checks to see if uh, our character C is, say, greater than or equal to the letter A. So this is a, a single quote, and then I can type the lowercase letter A. Now, I don't have to know what the numeric value of A is here uh, because behind the scenes that will be checked for me. Whatever they type this character in will be the same code that I'm using for this character. So if they type in an X, lowercase, that will definitely be further in the table than lowercase a. Now uh, they may have typed some character that comes in the table before lowercase a because it's not a lowercase letter. So I need to extend my condition here. So uh, if C is greater than lowercase, greater than or equal to lowercase a, it may be a lowercase letter, but it would also have to be, so and, that character is less than or equal to the lowercase letter z, so let's put these apostrophes kind of high to indicate that that's the lowercase z. So if all of those conditions hold, we could use some some kind of function here to print some basic, but this is not a standard C function, this is kind of pseudocode. Print lowercase. So we detected that it's lowercase. Now if it's not lowercase, it might be uppercase, so we could check for that too. We'll say else if, we just define the range through comparisons. So if C is greater than or equal to capital A, and C is less than or equal to capital Z. And then we could indicate that this is actually an uppercase character. So it is a uppercase. But the important part here is that none of this code required that I actually look into that ASCII table or whatever table of characters that I may be working with. I can just use the relationship between the character. Now it could also be a number. I better check that. Uh, so else if that character C is greater than or equal to the character 0, uh, which uh, just to make it clear that that's not um, a capital O, I'll put the little dot that's often rendered in terminal fonts there in the middle. So if my C is greater than or equal to the letter zero or the character zero, and that character is also less than or equal to the highest digit, which is the character for the digit nine, then we could print out that this thing was a number or a digit. So we could detect that pretty easily. Now, again, this may not seem particularly useful, having mentioned the fact that all of these range checking concepts are going to be incorporated by some standard function in any modern language 
that you use. What's important is that we can manifest these things ourselves. We can synthesize them because we understand the basic concepts of the relationships of characters regardless of the encoding that we are using. But we can further uh, leverage this for other purposes. For example, let's again say that I read a character from some input. So I can say uh, I get this character from some kind of fancy input. Right Now I have a character C. What I might want to do is ensure that I take any characters that I'm reading uh, and make them uh, uppercase, uh, if they happen to be a lowercase letter. So I could say something like this. If uh, C, just like we did before, is greater than or equal to uh, lowercase letter a, and c is less than or equal to the lowercase letter z, then I want to uppercase that letter before we do any other processing with it. So I need to replace that lowercase letter that's held in our character c with its uppercase equivalent. Again, in most standard libraries for your modern languages, there will already be functions to uppercase a character. In fact, there'll be, there's likely to be functions that uppercase entire strings. Uh, and while that is fine and you can use those methods, it is important to understand how they work because we can still gain a little bit more from this. So uh, in this case, what we need to do is figure out how to make that letter capital. And we want to do it without opening that ASCII table back up. Right. So we have to start to understand some things. Particularly, what we want to recall is that the letters all show up in order in the table. Right. So we have A, and then B, and then C, and then D, and so on. Uh, lowercase and the same relationship, uppercase. What we're going to do is first figure out how far into the alphabet our lowercase letter is. And then we can map that into the uppercase portion of the table. Now the way we'll do that, effectively, is to find something like, let's say they typed a lowercase uh, k. What we want to know is that k, from a zero-based perspective, we want to know that k is the tenth uh, indexed letter of the alphabet with an alphabet that starts at zero. Once we know that, so that this lowercase k is 10 away from a, then we can take that value, we can take that value 10 and offset whatever code capital A is by that number. So if we find out that k is 10 away from a, then we can just add 10 to a, capital A in particular, and then we'll have an uppercase k. And I'll show you how that works here. So we can say c is going to be equal to, first, how far in is this lowercase letter? Well, that's lowercase a minus our character c. This is not the letter C, it's just the name of our variable. Right. So this tiny piece of math has now calculated how far away from the lowercase letter A is this lowercase letter. And we know it's lowercase because of these conditions. So I can take that value then, although we don't really need the parentheses, I'm going to put them here just to emphasize that this was one concept uh, bundled together here. And we can offset capital A by this, so we can add capital A. And now what's going to happen is by the time this if statement is done, if we had a lowercase letter, that lowercase letter, whatever it may have been stored here in the variable C, will have become uppercase. Now that's also useful when uh, we are trying to figure out things like reading in numbers of some arbitrary format. So when people type input, uh, they may type in digits that look like this. So let's say they type that number uh, 1034 that we have seen 
in a previous video. When they type this, each of these are actually characters. They're not numbers. And the whole thing isn't a number. It just looks like a number to a human being. To the computer, there's just a series of individual characters. And for the most part, they'll be characters encoded in the ASCII table. So internally, when we want a set of keystrokes, which are really characters, to be converted into a number uh, that is the number that these characters represent abstractly, we're going to have to construct that number mathematically. So the first thing we have to do is figure out what the decimal equivalent of this digit really is. And what we don't want to do is write some if statement that says if the character is a zero, is the letter zero, then the value is the number zero. If the character is the letter one, then the value is the number one. Uh, that would just be a big waste. So again, let's say we have uh, something like a character C and it has received the uh, next uh, numeral from some input device or however this thing comes. It gets the next numeral. In this case that will be the character 1. What we need to do is find the value 1. So that might be stored in some integer. I'll call it value. And the way we can find that value directly is similar to what we did uh, up here. Here we found um, Oh my goodness, this is actually backwards. Uh, so hopefully you're watching all the way through and didn't give up when this happened. This should not be lowercase a minus c. This should be c minus lowercase a. Holy moly. Horrible mistake. Horrible mistake. But uh, I'm sure we can all deal with the correction. <laughs> so back here, we were finding how far away from the, the beginning of some section of the table our lowercase letter was. Now we have a, a digit, uh, a numeral, and we want to find how, how far away it is from the beginning of the numerals. So we're going to do the same kind of thing. We'll just subtract. We'll take C, the character that is a numeral that we just got, and we'll subtract the letter 0, or the character for 0, from it. So uh, if you think about this, regardless of what these letters are, let's say this, this here's a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Let's pretend, I'll just make up some arbitrary code. The SUNY Poly standard code uh, puts 0 at um, 123. Right? So this is 123, this is 124. 125, 126, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, and 132. Right. The point is here, it doesn't matter because if somebody puts in the numeral 1, this line of code will take the numeral 1, which is really the number 124, and subtract 0 from it, the character 0, which is really 123. So when you take 124 and subtract 123, you get 1, which is coincidentally the numeric equivalent to this character. Right? So the character 1 represents the number 1, which we just calculated. If we gave it a 5, that would be at 125, 26, 27, 28. So 128 minus 123 would give us 5, the equivalent of this digit. On the extreme example, if we would actually have sent in the character uh, 0, right, that character would be worth 123, and we would subtract from it the value of the character 0, also 123. 123 minus 123 is 0. And so we would have the digit there. And so this is a very useful bit of insight to just understand that uh, these characters, whether they're lowercase letters, uppercase letters, or numerals, are all located or, or arranged in order in a reasonable way in whatever your encoding is, so that we can write nice code like this to deal with uh, the character input that we get 
however it may come, uh, rather than having to do something like look up a table and hard code weird numbers behind the scenes. Because the moment that code ends up on a machine that uses a different encoding or the encoding changes, we might be in a bad place. But no one is going to make a new code that, uh, or no one is likely to, that's going to reorganize the basic understanding of the order of the letters of the alphabet whether uppercase or lowercase, or the same uh, with numerals. And so um, that's the basics of the ASCII table, which we barely cared about. It's really more about what can we do with it.